to Job out of the whirlwind. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? <laughs> Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and the thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed its boundaries and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther. Here shall your proud waves be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began? Or caused the dawn to know its place so it can take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under a seal. It's dyed like a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked and their upright arm shall be broken. Have you entered the recesses of the deep, walked midst the springs of the sea? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you walked and seen the gate of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of the light and where is the place of deep darkness that you may take it to its dwelling and discern the path to its home? Surely you know, for oh, you were born then and the number of your days is great. Hmm, where is the way to where the light is distributed or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail which I have reserved for the time of trouble for the days of battle and war? Who, who has cut a channel for the torrent of rain and a way for the thunderbolt so that it can bring the rain to a land where no one lives, to a desert which is empty of human life? Rain to satisfy a waste and desolate land to make the ground put forth grass. <sighs> Has the rain a father or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? Who has given birth to the hoarfrost of heaven? 
The waters become hard as stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. <sighs> Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, or loose the bonds of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season, or guide the bear and its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? And can you establish their rule on earth? Can you lift your voice to the clouds so that a flood of water may cover you? A flood of water that causes the dust to mass together and the clods cling to each other. <laughs> Can you hunt for the lion its prey? Or satisfy the appetite of the young lions as they crouch in their den or lie in wait in the covert? Or who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Hmm. Do you know when the mountain goat gives birth? Or have you observed the calving of the deer do you know the months that they fulfill? Do you see when it crouches to give birth, when it is delivered of its offspring, and the young become strong, and they grow up out in the open, and they go forth and do not return? Let the wild donkey go free. Who has loosed the bonds of the wild horse that ranges the steppe which I have given as its home and the salt land for its dwelling place? It scorns the tumult of the city. It does not hear the shout of the driver. No, it ranges the mountains as its pasture, as it searches after every green thing. And is it by your wisdom that the hawk soars and spreads its wings to the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes its nest on high? It lives on the rock. It makes its home in the fastness of the rocky crag. And from there, it spies its prey. From far away, it sees it. Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare. If you know all this, and so God just asked you a question. Declare if you know all of this. 
I do not. I know some parts. I do not know all of this. That's not a surprise. I'm some guy from Sioux, from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I, of course, don't know all of that. But neither do you. Neither do all of us all together know all of that. That is a truth to hold on to with all your might. It is a truth to remember. And it is a truth to keep your eye on. Because that question, do you know all of that? Can be asked all sorts of ways. In the book of Job, which you should read again, in the book of Job, that question is asked in order to shut Job's mouth. I do not like questions that are asked to shut anyone's mouth. It's one of the things you learn as a teacher. If your goal as a teacher is to be the smartest kid in the room, you should find another trade. Selling shoes would be good. <laughs> if my goal as a teacher is to come out of the room and with all of my students thinking, wow, he's the smartest kid in the room, I have failed. Because I have used the things that I have studied to shut their mouths, to shut their eyes, to shut their imaginations, and to shame them. Which is what Job's friends and then Job's God try to do in that book. Which makes for me the most lovely, tense relationship with the story that Pam just told. Pam and I have known each other, what, 15 years, something like. It is one of the great joys of my life that we get to think together, tell stories together, and that I get to watch her work. When she tells this story, I see the deep love of creation that energizes this story, the deep love of the complexity of all things that gives this story life. But because I study religion, I know also that the story is used in Job to shut Job's mouth and to stifle his imagination and to stop his questions. And because I study religion, I know that we use religion that way far too often. Maybe you have never run into anyone who used religion to tell you to shut up, but I have. And I fear that. Surely you know, says God in Job. And the only honest human response is, surely I do not. The only hopeful response is, the one I learned from my father, my father was a science teacher, an agriculture teacher, and a lover of the natural world. The proper response is, surely I do not, yet. But the complexities of life, the complexities of the real world, the complexities of creation, the complexities that defy our understanding are sometimes used to shut us up. Because it's not just the complexities in the book of Job that stymie us. 
Have you read the discussions? I mean the actual discussions of the reality of climate change. I have a friend who claims to have read them. He has not read very many of them, but he's read a particular set of them. And he uses his particular set of reading to say to people, but have you read this study that was published by? And then he cites some, some obscure study that I have to go find in order to find out exactly how disreputable it is. But he says to people, have you read this study, knowing that they have not? Surely you understand, he says. And then he talks about long-term climate cycles. My dad taught me about long-term climate cycles when I was seven years old. Ag teachers do things like that. But his goal is to say, in the midst of complexity, the complexity is far more than you could understand. So just shut up. And besides, anything you do would make no difference anyway. So just stop. Huh. And it's not just climate change. This past spring at Augustana University, a group of young, very idealistic, lovely human beings, a couple of them my advisees, asked the school to declare a meatless Monday, a day when the food in the cafeteria would be without the flesh of living beings. Some of the people that were calling for this were themselves ethical vegetarians. Some of them were aware of the environmental expense that goes with raising beef, pork, chickens, other such things. And so they asked for one day. Now, I was in on some of the side discussions. They were going to ask for more days than one. But they asked for one day. And as a result, the Beef Producers Association organized a call-in campaign to call the president every five minutes for three days running. Fortunately, our president has a backbone. She's kind, she's smart, and she's not afraid of much. But my students were amazed and offended and hurt. But my dad was an ag teacher. And so we had conversations about the economic facts of life, which include many of the students at Augustana come from ranches. They are at Augustana because their families raise beef. And they were not just talking about, we have to eat meat every day. They were, in fact, concerned about their family's ability to stay on the farm. If you have family members who farm, you know how difficult that is. Complexity is real. I learned that at an early age. My father believed that any proper education has its roots in the physical sciences, especially the life sciences. And so as a child, he taught me how com complex and lovely the world was. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. I wish I could take all of you for a walk with my father. Because walking with my father across an open field, it's like every plant reaches out and grabs his pant leg and says, ooh, 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 tell a story about me. And every animal and every collection of plants that live together. I was like five years old and he taught me what the word biome meant. Because my father taught me about the interconnected complexity of real life. And then when I was about nine years old, the book Silent Spring was published. And my father, because he was an ag teacher in a small town in southern Minnesota, was asked to do presentations on that book at our church. The pastor, a young idealistic man, very good, 
but not a farmer, a town kid, believed that what was needed was a round rejection of the use of all chemicals. That was difficult for my father because the chemicals in question had been used as part of a push against fire ants and as part of a push against malaria. I'm in favor of pushing back against malaria. And my father made an argument that was, for a while, rather unpopular. My father made an argument, I'm going to teach you how to be the son of an ag teacher, okay? You have to repeat after me. But of course, but of course it's more complicated than that. It's more complicated. My father stood up and said that, granting that DDT was fatal to birds and other living creatures, not just mosquitoes. My father argued that we yet ought pay attention to what it takes to protect human life as part of all life. Complication is hard. We tell stories sometimes because we believe that stories are simple. That only demonstrates that you've never listened to a story well. It only demonstrates that you've never paid attention to the real complexities of life. We tell stories because we wish for things to be simple. But of course, it is more complicated than that. It has always been more complicated than that. And it will be when our great-grandchildren are standing here, worshiping here, thinking here, praying here. It will be more complicated than that even then. So on this day, where we think about and celebrate the glorious complexity of creation, on this day, when we think about and pray about that great word that my dad taught me as a kid, ecology. We need to take that word apart because it doesn't mean what I thought it meant the first time I heard it. I thought it meant plants. It does, but it's more complicated than that. I thought it meant animals. It does, but it's more complicated than that. I thought it meant butterflies and mosquitoes, but it's more complicated than that. Ecology. It's an ology, which means it's a study of something. It's a study of eco. But that word doesn't mean plants, and it doesn't mean butterflies, and it doesn't mean even mosquitoes. Eco comes from a Greek word that means house. Ecology is the study of how we all live together in this great and vast house, this creation that God has knit together that includes mosquitoes and malaria which I will fight against any chance I have, which includes diseases that I will fight against any chance I have, and includes butterflies that flit through our backyard and land on our Asclepius plants. You can look that up if you don't know what that plant is. The question for the day is the question my father handed me for my life. How do we all live together? Three quick suggestions. We will not be able to live together if we are not willing to study the complexity. Second, we will not succeed in living together if we are not willing to look at the world in wonder and ecstasy. And third, 
we will not succeed in living together if we are unwilling to say, I surely do not know the answer to that yet. Honest humility is necessary, but a deep, aggressive even, willingness to grow what we understand and how we work to live together is absolutely essential. May you learn to listen. May you learn, as you listen, to study complexity. May you learn to wonder at the beauty of it all. And may you learn to be unanxious when, in the face of the question, do you understand it all? May you learn to say, oh, I do not. Thanks be to the God whose name is Mercy.